Thank you, everybody, for being with us. Welcome to the last chance for Caribbean Plan B webinar. I'm Ronnie Mashar. I'm Managing Director here at Rift Trust, based in Dubai. It is 1 p.m. Uh, here in the UAE. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and get started now. Uh, so just a quickly a little bit about our group. The Rift Trust is part of the Latitude Group. We are a specialist in the area of uh, private client citizenship and residency by investment program advisory. Um, we have also had well, not such uh, successes in the uh, over the years in uh, government advisory and have had a track record uh, as well in that area. To date, we've done over 6,000 clients across a number of different programs um, and been in operation for a little over 11 years now. Uh, the um, other thing that uh, is important to note is that um, you know we serve as the regional representative uh, for the Investment Migration Council, and uh, Investment Migration Council is a nonprofit uh, body that uh, is based in Switzerland that is uh, acts as our industry uh, regulator or standard setter, and we support the efforts of the Investment Migration Council uh, to support our industry. Uh, our presence is is quite quite diverse, quite spread all over the world, from uh, as far away as the United States to as far east as uh, as Hong Kong and and South Korea. Of course, our kind of nerve center is right in the the heart of it all uh, here in Dubai, where I'm based. Um, as an I as I always like to say, uh, if you're going to be uh, in the investment migration space, you should be in this um, in this this town. Dubai is an important place for investment migration. We have over 20 global offices, uh, more than 100 employees, and, and we speak many, many languages uh, across all of our various offices. Um, here's a, a brief snippet of what I was mentioning earlier uh, with respect to our government advisory experience. Uh, most recently in 2022, we were awarded as a uh, government marketing agent uh, for the St. Lucia Citizenship Investment Program. Uh, there's very few um, investment advisors like ourselves who uh, are awarded this. Um, you can see some of the other things where we've contributed to either existing programs or the design and implementation of new programs. Um, and, you know, going back to, um, you know, things like um, the Canadian Immigrant Investor Program to the, uh, the UK Tier 1 Investor to the Malta, uh, what was, you know, uh, known at the time as the Immigrant Investor Program and so on. So we've had some uh, quite varied and diverse experience with government advisory. This is a very interesting slide. I think that a lot of you will uh, will, will find um, interesting, especially if you're based here in the Middle East. So this data is from the Knight Frank uh, Wealth Report. Uh, and this is in respect to high net worth individuals who are planning to apply for a second citizenship uh, this year in 2024. So we're seeing an average across the world of 19%. But what's really interesting is that we see a huge uh, increase in Africa, where it was, I believe, 13% the year before, and now reaching 36% in North America. So these are two huge emerging markets for citizenship and residence by investment programs. A lot of people would ask, why would North American citizens, Canadians or, um, or American citizens, or perhaps even Mexican citizens, uh, be thinking for a second passport, be thinking of a second passport? Oftentimes, it's, it's uh, basically akin to a, a modern form of life insurance, you know, having um, the right to reside uh, in another country uh, and to, you know, be a citizen of that country with all the the, the privileges it, it it brings, along with, of course, the the passport uh, as um, you know as a representation of that country and the travel that you know travel uh, benefits or advantages that may come with that. But uh, these these numbers are um, you know are recent numbers and and certainly one point that I, I like to to discuss and and highlight with people is this um, you know we see five percent here in the Middle East of course these numbers were much higher before but uh, this is you know now become a fairly matured market uh, for you know uh, residents and citizenship by investment programs or investment migration at large uh, and we're seeing a lot of people in the Middle East are familiar with these programs they have. Um, you know, uh, either, you know, consider them themselves or they may know friends or family or business colleagues uh, who have acquired a second nationality or perhaps a residency uh, through investment, as opposed to traditional immigration programs. 
So when we talk about financial planning processes for, for high net worth uh, clients or individuals or families, um, there are many points that you know people are familiar with, including things like uh, education planning. You know, where will I send my children? You know, to for university. Uh, you know, diversifying current assets uh, or portfolios into maybe new markets or perhaps new new asset classes. Maybe you know, moving away from just holding the traditional asset classes like uh, you know land or or, uh, or you know real estate. Um, the form of you know rental apartments or, or homes um, to different sorts of insurance coverage, um, as well as you know tax planning as it may apply for a particular uh, family or individual based on where they may reside or their uh, their nationality. And how can they best um, and most efficiently plan for their taxes, and as well as estate planning, so future planning for when we're not here anymore and what that will mean for our uh, our children or grandchildren. And then, of course, plugging in the idea of citizenship and residence planning as part of the overall plan. This is an important point that we like to uh, approach with each and every family that we work with, um, you know, to try to have a comprehensive understanding of what their plans are, where do they see themselves in, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years, what do they think about the future for the next generation and how this might plug into their efforts to best preserve their wealth uh, and to give the next generation the best possible lives that they can. Uh, the benefits, of course, of a second citizenship, and of course, today we're, we're, we're focusing on the CBI of the RCBI, or Citizenship by Investment, of the Residency and Citizenship by Investment, um, you know, uh, aspect of our business. So the, the benefits are, are, of course, diverse. There are myriad, there's many, but, you know, we encompass them in a, uh, in a nice acronym of SMILE, so security, safety, mobility, investment, you know, lifestyle, um, you know, uh, education and employment opportunities. Obviously, security is important, especially for, you know, those clients or those families who may come from uh, countries that are facing, you know, um, uh, significant political or economic instability. And so they're looking for a secure destination that they can become a citizen of uh, and remain a citizen of. Investment opportunities can, can range quite uh, quite broadly across the, across the spectrum of, of different sorts of investments, but people are looking for ways, you know, perhaps to hedge their currency against something in, in a, a different country that's pegged to a more stable currency, um, an investment that might yield them, you know, not only uh, some return on that investment, financially speaking, but also an investment that may uh, also yield the, the the status, right, which is becoming a citizen of a new destination. Um, lifestyle, you know, of course, this, 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 uh, is different for each individual, but you know, perhaps an improvement in quality of life, access to healthcare, access to, you know, uh, being able to visit, you know, uh, new markets, to invest in new markets, uh, you know, uh, to have, um, you know, maybe access to capital, um, and being able, if they come from, you know, high risk jurisdictions, maybe perhaps lowering their risk because they become a citizen of a, a less risky jurisdiction. Uh, when it comes to, you know, doing, you know, banking business or, or accessing financing. Uh, education is, is really key. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, having a second nationality can, you know, make the make accessing uh, higher education in some of the, you know, the top destinations around the world, be that the US, the UK, Canada, etc, um, a little easier, uh, perhaps uh, just having visa free access to that country may be important, not so much for the student, but for the parents because the parents are sending their kids to live there and they wanna know that they can go to that country at any point in time. This kind of comes back to the safety thing, um, you know, that they can access the kid, their, their children, you know, should, should something, you know, God forbid something bad happen to them. So having that, that tie in of safety, security, mobility, you know, into the, the education. I've had several clients over the years who, you know, expressly stated, you know, I'm sending my kids to study in the UK. We don't live there. I wanna be able to access the UK. Um, you know, it's the first time my kids will be away from us. Uh, you know, so it's a, as a parent, you know, you 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 take every decision with their own, you know, families and, and children's well-being in mind. And of course, mobility. Mobility is maybe the the most, uh, you know, easily digestible uh, benefit of a second citizenship. Uh, for those who come from mobility challenged nations, uh, you know, having a second citizenship that opens up the world in that case is is really a you know a strong benefit uh, to them. You know, to their lifestyle, to their you know to their the opportunities that may come in the future. Uh, and of course, then, um, you know, the, the, 
the opportunities to do things that maybe that they couldn't do uh, in the in the past because of you know the, the restrictions around visas or you know the the kind of time uh, you know difficulties of you know I want to be an X destination but I have to prepare you know months in advance and I don't know if if what I want to be at next destination will be happening you know this event this meeting may change. You know, so being able to not worry about that can then free up people to do various different things. The word freedom is important. You know, it's uh, it's 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 part of part of what we aspire to. You know, to to enhance people's freedom. Uh, you know, with residency and citizenship by in investment, and you know, mobility freedom is not necessarily guaranteed. But if you have a citizenship and the passport of that country, then you have the right of entry into that country, and of course, then in implies their freedom to depart from the other countries. So, um, you know, this is where um, a citizenship uh, outweighs in value from a residency. Uh, and, you know, of course, with the citizenship comes the right to hold the passport, which is the, you know, the the, the key to that, uh, that mobility or freedom of mobility. Um, there have been, you know, some developments, and today's discussion is about the changes that are, that are upcoming in, uh, you know, in terms of pricing. Uh, but there have been other developments that happened, you know, last year, um, you know, with with the uh, Caribbean, you know, citizenship by investment countries, and you know, there are six CBI principles that all five of the countries have agreed to, and these include, you know, a collective agreement on the treatment of denial. So, what does that mean? That means you can't go around, you know, uh, shopping for a different venue. So. If you know person A is rejected in you know uh, country A, they cannot go to country B, C, D, etc. Uh, you know and apply. That you know once he's denied in one, he cannot apply in the others. That they would they would conduct interviews, which this process has started, um, and that you know th this is this will be part of the uh, the um, of the, the the due diligence process. Um, that additional checks, you know, that should should someone's background warrant additional further enhanced due diligence, that they would be willing to do that that they would audit their programs. This includes financial audits, that the governments themselves would, you know, ha allow for auditing of the programs for, you know, the purpose of, uh, you know, data retrieval and understanding, you know, the performance of their programs. That they would, you know, collectively agree to retrieve passports for people who maybe had, you know, um, you know, engaged in, in, in heinous crimes or egregious crimes, you know, post receiving the citizenship and having their, uh, you know the, their passports then revoked. You know for for those such crimes, uh, or if somebody had maybe you know uh, unfortunately been able to mislead in their application and be approved, that you know should you know um, uh, previous information come to light that you know was hidden, uh, that they could you know retrieve those passports and a, and a collective treatment with respect to you know the uh, outright banning of Russian and Belarusian nationals. That's, since the uh, the war uh, in Ukraine had started, uh, this was something that all five of the countries um, have agreed to, and have you know collectively put into place. Now today we're going to talk about the upcoming changes that are just you know almost one month to the day away. That um, uh, you know recently we we saw a memorandum that was signed by the prime ministers of Antigua and Barbuda, the Commonwealth of Dominica, Grenada, and Saint Kitts and Nevis. Um, to basically harmonize their programs. And their aim in, the aim in the harmonization is to ensure integrity, you know, of the programs, long-term sustainability, and, you know, cooperation among, you know, the five countries. So for those who, you know, have already acquired the citizenship, this is really a good thing because it's going to really strengthen the long-term sustainability and strength integrity of the program and, you know, and try to protect that, um, you know, that asset that that someone's invested. In. But what they've, what they've, um, you know, agreed in, you know, two or these sort of four, you know, uh, topics are heading. So security, basically having a common protocol for security checks and due diligence requirements among these countries. Um, that, you know, with respect to regulation, that there would be a standard, you know, set in accordance with international requirements and best practices. Again, this kind of has to do with due diligence and how you operate your program and the kind of information you collect. That there would be transparency among them. They would share information on the applicants, uh, on their source of funds, on compliance issues, uh, and best practice standards. Uh, again, to, you know, reinforce the strength of the programs, the integrity, uh, and, you know, aiming for long-term sustainability. As we 
Um, no, and the, and the data shows that, you know, the, these, especially when we saw how, you know, important these programs were to a, a COVID recovery, you know, for these nations. Uh, and then having this, you know, uh, surplus funds was really important for these governments. Uh, so it's important that they really protect these programs. And the last and important point is this price change, right? And that they would uh, agree to harmonize a minimum investment threshold of $200,000 by the 30th of June. So that's one month away from now. Uh, so we had four countries that, that signed on to this and St. Lucia did not sign on to this, as we know. However, within the last week or so, we have seen news come out of St. Lucia where, that they intend to sign this soon. We don't know the dates, um, nothing is for sure yet. However, we, we have seen that news come out. And while St. Lucia has, since the, the announcement of this, uh, this this memorandum and the signing of the memorandum by the four other countries in the Caribbean, uh, they've always supported, you know, all the, these these topics, right? Security and, and regulation and transparency. Uh, that the last point was the price change was the one that they were a bit hung up on and they wanted some time uh, to sort of get their get their things in order before committing to that. But it looks like they're they're going to commit to that as what we can see from the recent news reports. So the, the minimum we'd seen was $100,000, uh, where you had, for example, Dominica starting from $100,000, Antigua starting from $100,000. This is supposed to increase to $200,000 um, as a minimum threshold. Um, and that's that's what that, that memorandum was all about. So creating harmony with respect to price uh, and the other topics, uh, you know, and, and that's that's where, where we're, we're aiming to go uh, going forward. Um, now, this is important for those who are working on applications now, who are considering signing up now that, you know, do they have time? You know, we're one month away. Can we submit a file? I mean, the short answer is yes. You could submit a file and have it, you know, electronically submitted uh, before the, the 30th of June. Um, and what that will mean uh, is that, you know, somebody is on the current pricing. So I'll start now at transitioning into the individual programs before talking about the what ifs of what may come. Um, and to talk about the current scenarios of where we're going. So Antigua and Barbuda, these are real pictures from Antigua and Barbuda for those who uh, are interested to know. Um, so we, we, you know, um, one of the things to note, you know, about Antigua and Barbuda is that it is the only country in the Caribbean that has a, a visit requirement. This is after acquiring the citizenship. Um, this is one time in your life in the first five years of holding the citizenship. So after you acquired the citizenship and Antigua and Barbuda passport, you're required to meet a five-day visit requirement. And then when you renew your passport, you will be required to show evidence that you were physically present inside of Antigua uh, for a minimum of five days. Uh, and that pass, initial passport issuance is five years validity. Uh, and when you renew, it will be a 10-year validity, um, you know, barring that you've made the, uh, you know, you've made the, um, you've met the requirement, rather. Um, it's a cost-effective option for large families, uh, for sure, for families for six and up uh, via the University of West Indies option. Um, you can include, you know, your, obviously, your spouse, your children, your parents, your grandparents, siblings of the spouse or the main applicant uh, can also be included. Uh, so long as those siblings are married and, uh, sorry, unmarried and uh, don't have any children. Um, and, you know, there's, it's quite a strong passport. Recently, Antigua and Barbuda signed a visa uh, waiver agreement with China. Um, this has just gone into effect, um, in fact, this month. So this is a, a very, you know, important destination for business travel and uh, one that, you know, we frequently get asked about. So this is a um, a significant increase. Um, they do have long-standing visa waiver agreements with the UK, with the EU. Um, it is the only country among the Caribbean five that has a visa waiver agreement with South Africa. So that's a unique uh, point to it as well. Uh, and Antigua has, uh, you know, I mean, their GDP per capita is, is the highest, if not the highest among them, uh, and offers a really fantastic lifestyle and, you know, high quality infrastructure, uh, from the airport to the seaport to the roads uh, to the availability of healthcare and education on the island, it's it's, it's quite good. Um, in terms of qual who can qualify, of course, uh, you know the the main applicant, spouse, children up until the age of thirty, as long as they're financially dependent on the main applicant, 
parents and grandparents of the main applicant or spouse, and then siblings of the main applicant or spouse without an age limit. There's no age limit on siblings, but they, the siblings cannot be married, nor can they have children um, to be included. So that's, that's an important point and unique to Antigua as well. The, the um, starting option you know, for the, the National Development Fund of Antigua is $100,000. Um, and that is for a single applicant all the way up to a family of four. So that donation is $100,000 to the National Development Fund, uh, the government of Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, there's also a government processing fee, is worth noting, of $30,000, um, in addition to due diligence fees and, and agent fees. Um, real estate starts at $200,000. Now, these prices, the $100,000 is set to go up to $200,000. Now, with respect to real estate, there has not been an announcement made. Uh, we we expect that this price would likely double, but we don't know for sure if it will double. So it may go up to $400,000, but we're still waiting on an official announcement of what that will look like. Um, and the we you know the expectation is that the you know the donation amount would move from one hundred thousand to two hundred thousand, as per the communication from the uh, original memorandum that was signed by the prime ministers. Uh, Dominica, again, another real picture of Dominica, absolutely stunning, um, known as the Nature Isle and a um, an ecotourism destination for sure. Um, so I get some some other uh, pictures for your viewing pleasure. Uh, so Dominica also, um, you know, um, like the other Caribbean countries, with the exception of Antigua, does not have a, a stay requirement whatsoever. Everything can be done remotely. Um, the you know the, the, in terms of who can be included, obviously the main applicant, spouse, children, parents, and grandparents. Uh, it does have access to China. This is another fairly recent addition uh, to uh, Dominica. Um, and it, you know the on the the other you know point to set Dominica aside from the others is that it does not have visa free access to the UK or Ireland, but does have a visa free access to the European Union. Um, so Dominica uh, also, I, I believe, you know, for those who uh, maybe would enjoy a um, an island where is more nature bound. And less, you know, uh, kind of infrastructure development than Dominica is the is the certainly the place. Uh, it's a big destination, as I mentioned earlier, a moment ago for ecotourism. Um, you know, there's quite a quite a bit to see uh, um, if you you know for that uh, kind of thing. And there's you know some uh, nice industry being developed around ecotourism. Uh, Dominica has also probably led the way in trying to be the most um, you know environmentally sustainable. Uh, among them, um, and really, you know, they've you know done things like you know trying to develop you know geothermal power, uh, and you know uh, trying to build homes that are you know tropical storm and, and hurricane resilient, um, and you know and really taking a very proactive approach to you know climate change and how it may affect them specifically in Dominica. Um, in terms of mobility, still quite strong. You're talking about more than 140 countries around the world with visa-free uh, access. Um, it's important to note that parents and grandparents should be over the age of 65. Um, children can be added up until the age of 30. Um, and these are children who are financially dependent. So if there's someone who's 27, 28 years old, they're still a student, maybe they're uh, you know, a graduate student, they're working on a master's degree, a PhD, et cetera, um, and they uh, you know, are financially dependent on their, the main applicant who's the parents, they can be included. If you have an unmarried daughter who is financially independent, meaning they're working, they can still be included if they are under the age of 25. So there is a, um, uh, let's say, a cultural uh, acknowledgement uh, with respect to um, uh, that uh, for Dominica, which is unique to their program. But again, they, the, uh, the parents and grandparents should be age, over the age of 65 and financially dependent on the main applicant or spouse. The donation amount in Dominica starts from $100,000 for the Economic Diversification Fund uh, and goes up to $175,000 for a family of four, real estate starting at $200,000. Um, this, of course, is expected to double to $200,000. 
uh, with real estate going up, but yet we don't know what the real estate new amount will be. Still waiting on an official announcement from the government as they're deliberating that now. Uh, we should hear that in the coming days or week. Uh, Grenada is another uh, one of the, uh, the, the islands in the Caribbean, uh, not to be confused with the destination in Spain. Uh, same name, different place. Um, again, real pictures from Grenada um, has um, a, one of the top 30 beaches in the world, Grand Anse Beach. In fact, I think this is a photo of it here um, and is, you know, consistently rated as, you know, one of the best beaches to visit in the entire world. So quite, quite a destination uh, for, for tourists. Grenada is a, a, a unique program in that it has a, uh, is the only country in the Caribbean to have um, the negotiated E2 visa with the United States. Uh, so the E2 visa is a is a treaty. Uh, there are several countries around the world, um, you know, and in, including some here in our region like Egypt and Jordan, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka. These all these countries are members of the E2 visa treaty with the United States, and that that states that citizens Turkey as well. Um, so citizens of those countries uh, can open a business in the United States. Uh, and um, obtain a non-immigrant visa, so a residence visa, essentially, in the U.S. based on your investment. It says a significant amount should be invested. That's usually defined as $100,000 or more into your business. It's a business of your choosing. Uh, and then, you know, um, you can acquire a residence visa that allows you and your family to legally reside in the U.S. That is unique to Grenada. The other countries do not have that. Grenada does have uh, access to China. It has access to the UK. It has access to the EU countries. So um, again, making it a, a very um, strong and useful, uh, you know, uh, passport for those who may travel frequently or if their uh, their work or employment uh, requires them to move around various parts of the world. Definitely a strong a strong passport in that regard. Um, in terms of who can be included, uh, they are, of course, the main applicant, their spouse, children, parents, as well as siblings. However, there is a significant increase in cost uh, when including siblings of the main applicant. Um, one important point to note with respect to who qualifies is that parents can be included, but at the age of 55, uh, same for Antigua, but um, here, Grenada, they have 55 and up, whereas um, uh, Dominica has 65 and up. So uh, for parents, uh, you know, um, if those, you know, uh, forming applications, including their parents, it's important to note the age uh, requirements of each jurisdiction. The Grenada contribution amount uh, to the NTF or National Transformation Fund of Grenada starts at $150,000 and goes up to $200,000 for a family of four. Now the starting point should go up to $200,000 or more, uh, depending on what the, the government of Grenada uh, will do. Um, so that would go from a single applicant starting at 200K or possibly higher. Currently the real estate, the legislation allows for real estate to start at $220,000. Of course, we expect that to go up, but still waiting on um, the government directives on what exactly that number will be. St. Kitts and Nevis. Now, this is interesting because St. Kitts and Nevis, obviously being the oldest program, the most well-known program, uh, they've had the citizenship by investment legislation on their books since 1984 uh, and makes it the oldest official program in the world. It's still in operation. Again, real pictures of St. Kitts and Nevis for your viewing pleasure. Uh, so St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, you know, uh, is consistently ranked the highest among them in terms of passport ranking. Uh, usually, you know, more than 150 countries, visa-free or visa on arrival access. Um, it's usually ranked by most of the passport rankings around 25th strongest passport in the world. Um, and, you know, there are um, some interesting things here. St. Kitts offers visa-free access to Taiwan, uh, while it does not offer visa-free access to China like the others do. Um, there's no uh, stay requirement in St. Kitts, uh, and, you know, main applicants can include, you know, their, uh, their spouse or children, parents, and grandparents. Siblings are no longer allowed it there to be included in St. Kitts. Um, the, again, it, it's important to note the age of parents or grandparents is 65 and up. Uh, so that's, that's an important point. Like Dominica, St. Kitts requires 65 and up, while the others are 55 and up. 
Uh, now, St. Kitts in July of 2023 revamped their program and amended their legislation. So they already are above the minimum threshold of $200,000. They are signatory. The Prime Minister, uh, Terence Drew he, of St. Kitts and Nevis, he did sign uh, the agreement with the others. Um, you know, So they are signatory to that. However, they're already above that minimum threshold at $250,000. So if we see any changes, perhaps we would see some change downward and not upward, uh, or perhaps we won't see any change at all. Uh, but that is yet to be determined if they will amend their current legislation. But that has been in place since July of 2023. So the current investment thresholds, just to recap what we've uh, just reviewed, uh, we have $100,000 starting in Antigua, same for Dominica, $150,000 for Grenada, and of course St. Kitts, which is at $250,000. Now the increase is set to begin from the 30th of June. Uh, as per the, the memorandum that was signed by the four prime ministers. Of course, St. Kitts is already above that. Okay. And I think now we can go over to um, a couple of questions. Um, so we, we, we've heard, you know, what is um, people asking, you know, like uh, what are the most common nationalities that we see, obviously, being here in the UAE uh, and the, quite the, the, the melting pot that the UAE is, uh, you know, we have a really diverse range of nationalities from all over the Middle East, from South Asia, uh, you know, from Africa, West Africa, North Africa, East Africa, South Africa, so from the entire continent, really, from both the Anglophone countries as well as the Francophone countries. Um, and, you know, we, we've seen consistent interest uh, you know, from, uh, you know, the, the countries in the Middle East, like Lebanon, uh, Syria, you know, we've seen consistent interest from Egypt, uh, you know, we've seen consistent interest from, you know, Nigeria, we see consistent interest from South Africa, from Pakistan, from China, uh, you know, so, you know, there's quite a few nationalities that we work with. What's most, op what's the most popular, you know, option? Um, the most popular program historically, I think, just by pure numbers, has been St. Kitts and Nevis. I think recently we've seen a bit of a shift, but obviously because of the price increase being so much more than the others, we've seen a shift towards Antigua and Grenada. Um, and especially with Antigua adding China recently, China's become more and more a topic of discussion and people asking for it. Uh, so we, you know, we have seen that. Um, and we, you know, we continue to see uh, demand across, you know, really all of these programs. In terms of um, absolute deadline, uh, you know, the, um, I'm going to just move quickly though, I'm going to move to stop the share here. Um, we can go to here. So um, absolute deadline for the price increase. Now, as per the, um, you know, what, what the memorandum that was signed, it was June 30th. Uh, however, um, we don't really, uh, you know, uh, you know, we, in our discussions, uh, you know, uh, that we, we've, you know, expect that there could be some delays in implementing because, you know, legislation needs to be amended and that takes time. So there could be, and I, I say could be because we don't know for sure, uh, there could be some delays in implementation of uh, this, you know, this deadline where we might see a more softer approach where perhaps, you know, uh, it be, you know, the following quarter or by the end of the year, or perhaps, you know, somewhere in between files that are submitted would be as per the, you know, current existing legislation. Um, and, you know, then after, you know, X date, it will be as per the new legislation. Um, but, you know, I, I know that, you know, it's it's safe to assume that you know, they are working to amend the legislation uh, to and, you know, and determine what that pricing structure will look like, you know, as we speak. Um, there's another question about uh, St. Lucia and what that means, um, you know, that they didn't sign. Well, they, it's true. They didn't sign. They've always been in support of this. Very publicly, they said they supported this. Uh, this concept. Now, they, they just, you know, a few days ago signaled that they would sign. Uh, so, you know, we expect that there will be some changes in St. Lucia, but we don't know what that timeline will look like. 
Um, currently, St. Lucia starts at you know one hundred thousand dollars contribution to the National Economic Fund, uh, and you know that the the real estate uh, option you know is at two hundred thousand dollars. Will will that double uh, in in the, the same time frame? You know, by the the uh, the thirtieth of June as the others, we, we really don't know yet. So, if there's any other questions, please uh, let, be happy to take them. All right. Um, I appreciate everyone being here with us today. Happy to have had this opportunity to present uh, and give everyone an update on what's happening. And uh, thank you, everybody, for your time. It's my pleasure to be your host today. Uh, and I wish everyone a fantastic day. Thank you.